Good morning, everybody. My name is Sarah Stride, and I'm a midwifery lecturer practitioner. I've been a diabetes midwife since 2010, and as part of my master's study, I undertook a service improvement project aimed at improving care for women who are at risk of developing gestational diabetes. During this webinar, uh, my plan is to use the case study to explain um, why I used the service improvement project to highlight the importance of screening women for gestational diabetes. The webinar will include an outline of the service improvement methodology that I used and will include discussion around the role of the midwife, particularly in how we screen for gestational diabetes um, and its consider its implication for pregnancy and we'll use an evidence-based approach to care. Locally, it was noted that women were not attending for their glucose tolerance test appointments in the maternity unit once they'd been arranged by their midwives. There was also an increasing number of women that were waiting for appointments for glucose tolerance tests. This led to a bit of conflict and led to difficulty in allocating appointments, whilst we found that other appointments were actually being wasted. As you know, any delay in the identification or treatment of gestational diabetes could actually impact on both maternal and fetal outcomes. So this helped to identify um, an idea for a service improvement project. Service improvement methodology has been around for quite a while, and so this was a really useful approach to undertaking this piece of work. Um, I've outlined the components there, which is plan, do, study, act. This approach enables specific projects to be undertaken, which could be used as a pilot before you undertake a bigger piece of work. So identifying the problem was at my place to start. For this case study, this was that women were not actually attending for their glucose tolerance test appointments. And what I was able to identify was that some midwives gave more information to women than others about why they actually should, should attend for the glucose tolerance test. We know it's not a very pleasant experience to have the glucose tolerance test, so thinking about ways to encourage women to attend if they had been identified at risk of developing gestational diabetes was important. When you go back to the literature, there is a lot of information in the literature about diabetes. However, a lot of that information is aimed at nurses, not necessarily at us as midwives. So this helped me to decide that perhaps providing more education to midwives, particularly around diabetes and how we screen for it in pregnancy, might help to address this issue of women then not coming for their appointments. So the intervention that I created was a diabetes workshop with a particular focus on midwives' role um, in the antenatal period and how we screen for gestational diabetes. Part of the, the work also identified whether midwives themselves felt it was beneficial to come to a diabetes workshop to ask them to consider what level of knowledge of skills and um, information they already had before the education was provided, and then asked at the end of the workshop whether they felt that the information they had received that morning was beneficial. Also, um, finding out from women's attendance at antenatal clinics so for their glucose to tolerance test appointments, were women attending um, not, not attending because the time slots were very limited, um, or was there any actual increase in attendance once the midwives provided them with more information? During um, pregnancy, we know that the gestational diabetes occurs. And although midwives do receive some training on diabetes, historically, there has been a huge focus on providing care in labor and maybe not quite as um, much importance placed on information being given antenatally. So the information on the workshop included a revision of the different types of diabetes. During the um, workshop, we discussed when type 1 diabetes might have occurred. Um, you know it's because the insulin-producing cells in the body have either been destroyed or the body's actually unable to produce any insulin. 
as that insulin is a chemical messenger to help your um, body to give you energy, you could actually envis envisage it as a key. It's a key that unlocks the door to the body's cells. And once the door's unlocked, glucose can enter the cells and it's used as fuel. But because in type 1 diabetes the body is unable to produce any insulin, there is no key to unlock the door and the glucose levels actually build up in the blood. In type 2 diabetes, not enough insulin is being produced by the pancreas or the body cells aren't responding to insulin in the same type of way. This is called insulin resistance. It usually occurs in those aged 40 or above and 85% of patients that actually have diabetes usually have type 2. There's a link included on the slide here that takes you, takes you to a very useful film on the Diabetes UK website. Um, it's an animated film and just shows you, uh, talks you through really the signs and symptoms that are available. So we're now going to explore gestational diabetes in more detail. So gestational diabetes is glucose intolerance that occurs or is identified during pregnancy. It's often a result of insulin resistance caused by placental hormones which lead to increased blood glucose levels in the mother's blood. In your local trusts, you will be using different risk factors to screen for this. But I'll give you some examples which are um, a raised BMI above 30, if, if a woman's had a previous macrosomic baby weighing 4.5 kilograms or more, someone who's previously had gestational diabetes, when they have a family history of diabetes, so that could be a first degree relative with diabetes, a family origin with a high prevalence of diabetes, including those that are South Asian, Black Caribbean and Middle Eastern. But when you review all of those risk factors, Obesity is considered to be the main contributory factor for gestational diabetes. In the USA, a quarter of all 20 to 44 year olds are overweight. And in the UK, this figure has reached 20% of the population. Obesity is a notable risk factor that affects both maternal and fetal outcomes. And pre-pregnancy obesity is a particular risk factor for stillbirth. Now, weight is generally considered to be quite a sensitive topic for women. And although midwives know that they should motivate women to make changes to their lifestyle, they are often torn between developing empowering relationships with women um, and are quite keen to avoid any confrontation. However, the literature does highlight that women could reduce their risk of developing gestational diabetes by up to 50% if they were to undertake physical exercise. So it's definitely a topic worth addressing. Diabetes in pregnancy is associated with risk to the woman and to the developing fetus. Uh, miscarriage, preeclampsia and preterm labour are all more common in women with pre-existing diabetes. Um, also stillbirth, congenital malformations, macrosomia and birth injury are all linked to actually existing diabetes in pregnancy. So screening for gestational diabetes um, also causes a little bit of a discussion. There is some discrepancy in the literature regarding when you should test. In the UK, um, the NICE guidance recommends using a 75 gram load of glucose with blood tests prior to administration and two hours following. Um, and most advocate screening women for response to risk factors. But certainly in other countries, they screen all women rather than be in, in response to our risk factors identified here. In America, they test all women at booking. So as we've mentioned, in the UK, NICE recommend that we screen in response to risk factors. That blood test is usually under undertaken at 20, between 26 and 28 weeks of gestation unless the woman has had gestational diabetes in a previous pregnancy and then the screening is recommended between 16 and 18 weeks um, and if that was negative to repeat it again at the 26 to 28 week period. So what's the midwife's role? The midwife's role is definitely about providing information about what the test is, how it's going to be undertaken, why we're screening and how she will actually get the results. This is particularly important 
as in GP practices, parameters of diagnosing um, just of, just of diagnosing diabetes in pregnancy um, may get overlooked. GPs use GTTs to undertake screening for diagnosing type 2 diabetes in the normal population, so non-pregnant population. And a positive result would be above 11 millimoles per litre. Whereas I've highlighted on the screen that actually when we're screening for gestational diabetes, a fasting glucose of above 5.6 millimoles per litre or the two-hour um, measurement of 7.8 millimoles per litre or above would diagnose diabetes in pregnancy. It also shouldn't be underestimated how women might feel at actually receiving a positive result. We all know that everybody expects things to happen to somebody else and not them. So you may well have explained what the test, test is, why it's undertaken, and why we're actually screening for diabetes and why it's important that she attends for her test. But having looked at the literature, many women actually say they feel like they've been struck by lightning and completely shocked as they had no apparent symptoms of diabetes, they had no expectation that it could be them that then receives the positive diagnosis. So women um, will benefit definitely from continuity of care because they may well have been shocked and they are dealing with that psychologically in addition to needing ongoing providing support and care. They will have care from shared care from an obstetrician and a diabetes team, which could include dietitian, diabetes nurse or midwife, and endocrinologist. But equally, it's important that the other aspects of care that all women would receive during pregnancy are not overlooked, including support for parent education, providing tours of the units, and discussing their birth plans. Women who develop gestational diabetes or have diabetes are always at increased risk of developing preeclampsia, so their blood, push, blood pressure should be re, uh, monitored on a regular basis. So women that have received this diagnosis of, that they have gestational diabetes will be asked to monitor their blood sugars four times a day. That's a big change to their lifestyle, having to carry their equipment around to actually be able to undertake um, these tests. They'll be asked to monitor their blood sugar on waking and then an hour after each meal. They may or may not need then later on education regarding the safe administration of insulin, how, it's, how it can be administered, how to store it safely. That would usually come under the remit of the role of the diabetes midwife but they may well wish to discuss that with any midwife and just require some support. Antenatally, you could also be asked to help prepare for infant feeding, so teaching your women how to do hand expression and to store colostrum um, safely in the freezer prior to any admission for labour um, or induction. There's also time for discussing how to manage diabetes in labour, which in would include the frequency of monitoring blood sugars in labour, depending on your local trust policy, and whether at what point an insulin infusion might be started in response to her sugar levels. I've put the long word there, variable rate insulin infusion, that used to be known as the sliding scale, so that she's aware of what those, that term, terminology means and that she might need an intravenous infusion during labour to maintain um, at stable blood sugars prior to the baby being born. Postnatal care would also involve giving advice to her ongoing about infant feeding, also from when, when, when she may or may not need to continue her monitoring her blood sugars. An individualised um, plan on how this would be managed would be sensible and included in her notes antenatally so that she knows what to expect postnatally. As gestational diabetes has an impact on the women's long-term health, um, with more than 50% of women going on to develop type 2 diabetes within 5 to 10 years of delivery, providing ongoing advice and support for diet and lifestyle changes would equally be beneficial, as women are much more likely of de developing type 2 diabetes in later life. 
This actually concludes my information on gestational diabetes, as there hasn't been time to go on and discuss diabetes in lots of detail. But just one safety aspect, I've included the insulin syringe there to remind all midwives that when preparing insulin infusions that you must use the insulin um, syringe, not a one mil syringe, otherwise you could give 10 times the dose of insulin that you'd need. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>